Welcome to Molecular Methods with Jesse. Please subscribe, like and share if you'd like to learn more about molecular approaches. So today I'm going to give you a real simple introduction to QTL mapping and we're going to answer the questions, what is QTL mapping, what do you need it for, how does it work and what potential problems could we encounter. So to define what a QTL is we should first define what QTL stands for, in this case quantitative trait loci. QTLs are areas within the genome which contribute to the magnitude of a measurable trait, which is often influenced by more than one gene, also known as a complex trait. A good example of a complex trait influenced by a QTL in the case of plants is height or drought tolerance. Therefore, QTL mapping, the focus of this episode, is exactly what it sounds like. It's an approach used in genetics to define the chromosomal position of these QTLs. QTL mapping can be classed as a forward genetic approach because we use the phenotype of interest and we map it to a physical position within the genome using molecular markers. Hence, the question we are trying to answer using this approach is what key loci are playing a role in our phenotype of interest and where are they physically in the genome? It's important to note that QTL mapping is often confused with GWAS, genome-wide association studies. Most papers I've seen distinguish the two by the materials and approach used. QTL mapping uses experimental crosses in related mapping populations to identify genotype trait associations. However, GWAS approaches use populations of unrelated individuals to identify any associations. Also, it should be noted that where QTL analysis deals with the contribution of a locus to variation in a continuous trait like height, GWAS studies tend to focus on associations between alleles and a binary trait, such as suffering from a disease or not. What do you need for QTL mapping? Well, there are three basic things you need, and we'll discuss them sequentially so you can kind of put this together and see how this approach works. So the first thing you need is a mapping population, the second thing you need is a knowledge of molecular markers, and the third thing you need is a measurable trait. So what is the mapping population and how do we create it? Simply, the mapping population is a group of related individuals we characterise in order to locate our QTLs. To create the mapping population, we first take individuals which are showing extreme trait values at both ends of the spectrum. For example, if you're studying drought tolerance in a crop, make sure you have available individuals with very high drought tolerance and also individuals with very poor tolerance. These are known as true breeders due to their extreme phenotypes and they are likely to be homozygotes at the critical loci underlying the trait of interest. We then mate these individuals, generating what we call an F1 generation. These plants are likely to be heterozygotes at the critical loci relating to the trait. Finally, we inbreed the F1 generation and create the recombinant inbred line F2 population. This becomes your mapping population, and these are the plants which we will phenotype. As I said earlier, we need a knowledge of molecular markers. Molecular markers are small genetic differences or polymorphisms used to identify different features in DNA sequences and can be used to differentiate between individuals of a population or to classify individuals between different varieties or cultivars within a species. In QTL mapping, molecular markers are used as signposts and allow us to track the inheritance of different regions of the genome after recombination, ultimately enabling us to narrow down regions influencing our traits of interest. In order to be effective, we need to make sure we have molecular markers identified at positions about 10 to 20 centimorgans apart throughout the entire genome. There are many kinds of molecular marker, but I'm going to give you three examples here. RFLPs are restriction fragment length polymorphisms. These are polymorphisms which can be identified by digesting DNA using a restriction enzyme, as they appear within the sequences recognised by these enzymes. In order to distinguish individuals, a DNA sample is digested into fragments by restriction enzymes, and the resulting restriction fragments are then separated by gel electrophoresis according to their size. Another kind of molecular markers are SSRs which are simple sequence repeats or microsatellites. Sometimes they can be described as genetic stutters because they are a short sequence repeated multiple times which is frequently mutated between individuals. Sequencing can help identify differences in SSRs between individuals. My final example of a molecular marker is an SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. 
These are single base pair changes in genetic sequence at a specific position and are found in a large proportion of the population. Again, sequencing is going to help you identify these. The final component to a QTL mapping experiment is the measurable trait. It's really important that the trait you are trying to define has attributes which can be measured. This may not be immediately obvious in some more complex trait, like drought tolerance, which I mentioned earlier. Solutions are specific to a crop species, but considering rice or maize, for example, we could measure attributes like leaf curling, dry biomass and yield in order to assign a numerical value to drought tolerance. So once you've created your mapping population, defined your molecular markers, measured your traits, you need to then genotype the F2 inbred individuals before you can perform a linkage analysis. I've, re I've represented the sort of substeps to this stage of the QTL mapping process below. Simply put, you extract the DNA of the mapping population, perhaps using grinding and some kind of extraction kit. Then you sequence the DNA and use bioinformatics software to identify from the DNA which traits have co-segregated with the molecular markers. Finally, we conduct a linkage analysis, which is the statistical step of the mapping process which allows us to identify QTLs. Linkage analysis relies on the concept that the nearer two genetic elements are on a chromosome, the lower the chance of recombination between them, and the more often they co-segregate. The more specifically a trait segregates in the F2 generation with a specific molecular marker, the more likely it is that the molecular marker is close to a gene influencing our trait of interest. Programs are available for linkage analysis, but to explain it simply, they use a probability threshold to identify additive genetic loci influencing our trait of interest. Program output often looks something like the graph here where chromosomal position is plotted against the probability or likelihood that a specific locus has an effect on the trait of interest. The red dotted line here represents a probability threshold, and above this we can see a peak. This peak is a chromosomal position linked with the trait of interest, and we can conclude from this that genes which influence the trait lie somewhere here. Further fine mapping and mutational analyses are required to fully elucidate exactly which genes are influencing the trait of interest. We should now consider what problems might crop up when using this approach. QTL locations, as defined by molecular markers in segregating populations, can have really large confidence intervals, often more than 5 centimorgans and up to about 30. Considering a typical chromosome is 100 centimorgans, this can result in really large areas of the genome being implicated with this specific trait. Also, it's important to consider that although having a lot of molecular markers is crucial to the accuracy of this approach, you cannot reduce the confidence interval by having more with closer spacing between them. The only way that you can reduce the confidence interval is to considerably increase the population size. The reason for these large confidence intervals is simply a lack of recombination at meiosis. It can also be really difficult to distinguish between QTLs which are less than 20 centimorgans apart even when they have moderate heritability. You may accidentally be interpreting two QTLs within this range as just one. Also, remember that once you've narrowed down an additive region of the genome, you will need to conduct some kind of fine mapping, which is extra work. Lastly, we should consider the practicality of this approach. It takes immense expertise, time and expense for this approach to be successful. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about QTL mapping, I've linked in the description an article, book and video which you might want to check out. To learn more with Molecular Methods with Jesse, please like, subscribe and share. See you next time.